Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on what time zone you're in, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Neil Burton. I'm a senior application specialist at Ithera Medical, and I'd like to welcome you to this webcast on oxygen-enhanced optoacoustic tomography. We will have about 30 minutes of presentation and then open it up for questions. At any time, you can type in your questions in the question box uh, of the, on the webinar status bar, and we'll try to cover as many of these items as we can during the Q&A session at the end. In addition, this presentation will be recorded and you will re all receive a link to the recording and a follow-up email in the next few days. And now, let me introduce you to Dr. Sarah Bondiak, who's a reader in biomedical physics at the Cavendish Laboratory and group leader at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. She will give this presentation today and I will now hand this over to Sarah, who will lead you through the presentation. Thanks very much, Neil, for the introduction, and hello to all the attendees from here in Cambridge. I'm delighted to talk to you today about our work assessing tissue oxygenation uh, using multispectral optoacoustic tomography. First, I'd like to explain a little bit about why we're interested in assessing oxygenation, particularly in tumors. If we think about the development of the early disease, when cells undergo malignant transformation and begin to proliferate, they eventually encounter a size limit, which is typically uh, agreed to be about one millimeter cubed, where the center of the tumor is unable to receive oxygen from the blood supply because it's beyond the oxygen diffusion distance in the tissue. As a result, these cells have to adapt in order to survive, and they secrete angiogenic factors, which promote the growth of blood vessels from the surrounding vasculature and also use other mechanisms by which they can vascularize themselves and develop a tumor that's able to um, get access to nutrients and oxygen from the blood supply. That tumor will then continue to grow and reach a size of around a centimeter cubed or larger typically at the point of diagnosis. Um, and of course, ultimately, we are wanting to use that blood supply to deliver chemotherapies with which we can shrink the tumor after treatment. Digging into this a little bit further, one thing that's always interesting is to highlight the differences between the normal vasculature and the tumor particularly looking at the perfusion-limited delivery of oxygen bound to hemoglobin in the blood vessels versus the diffusion-limited uh, supply of oxygen out into the tissues when the oxygen is leaving the hemoglobin in the red blood cells and passing out into the interstitium of the tissue. In particular, the tumor cells will suffer from a an inefficient orientation and geometry of vessels and often uh, lack any arterial to venous flow, which means that there will be um, significant areas of the, the tumor which are uh, not supplied with oxygen, even in a well vascularized environment. So this means that we have a high degree of heterogeneity in tumors in respect of the oxygen delivery, so supply and demand. And this can lead to a balance where in some areas, we have cells that are undergoing hypoxic stress due to an absence of oxygen, whereas in others, we can have cells undergoing oxidative stresses due to a supply of oxygen, a high supply of oxygen. In both cases, however, this can lead to tumor progression, and in particular, it's been implicated in enhancing cell survival, uh, increasing therapy resistance, and also uh, enabling metastasis. Now, if we want to study these processes, if we want to understand um, the supply of oxygen and the demand in the tumor, and particularly look at uh, the uh, areas of hypoxia, for example, we need imaging methods non-invasively to do that. If we think about the imaging methods that are available to us uh, in standard medical imaging technologies, we might think about x-rays where we can look at blood perfusion using a contrast enhancement with injected contrast agents. We could use positron emission tomography, injecting either radioactively labeled water to look at perfusion or particular hypoxia traces such as f mice or ES5, which will accumulate in hypoxic tissues. However, both of these require ionizing radiation, and so for longitudinal monitoring are not always adopted. We can go to the other end of the spectrum in the radio waves and look at magnetic resonance imaging as well. And there are a large number of different methods that we can employ here if we want to look at um, oxygenation or at perfusion. For example, blood oxygen level dependent MRI, oxygen enhanced MRI, or dynamic contrast enhanced MRI with the injection of a contrast agent. 
But still, MRI also suffers some limitations requiring large implementation, and the metrics that you derive from these methods are typically qualitative. This is where, in my team, we think that the use of visible near-infrared light can come in. And one particular interest in this um, range of wavelengths is the fact that oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin exhibit differential absorption coefficients. So we can uh, take data at multiple wavelengths, which is where the multispectral comes from in the NSOP, which allows us to resolve these different spectral components and hence derive the total content of hemoglobin in the tissue as well as its oxygenation status. Now, the reason it's good to do this with optoacoustic modalities is that if we try to access these um, contrast mechanisms using only optics, our ability to resolve um, these interactions at depth is limited by light scattering in tissue. And here's an example um, taken from a review article published a few years ago, which shows that if you um, actually shine a, a laser pointer onto a, a clear liquid such as water, you just get the standard exponential decay of the signal Whereas if you shine it on a uh, scattering media such as tissue, the behavior is diffusive and it's very difficult to localize the signal and there's a much more rapid decay in the signal intensity. How do we overcome this then? Well, we will shine laser light onto the tissue and when the light is absorbed, in addition to generating an all optical interaction, we can also look at the heating that's generated, which gives uh, an increase in pressure and generates ultrasound. We can detect this at the tissue surface using an ultrasound transducer, and that generates a signal from the photoacoustic effect, which we can then measure, and the properties of that signal help us to form images. For example, the arrival time can help us to localize where the signal came from in the tissue. And that allows us to use these optical interactions, but generate images with uh, up to several centimeters of depth in the tissue. Well, if we're using multispectral optoacoustic tomography, we are able to then compose tomographic images of small animals in particular. And here you see an example of a cross-section through the torso of a mouse, where we've looked at the contributions of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin to the signals. And what I'm mapping here is the intensity of oxyhemoglobin content at every pixel. So those areas with very high signal have a high level of oxyhemoglobin content. And the scale bar in this image is about three millimeters, and it was acquired in less than a second. What this shows you is that using MSOC gives you an opportunity to see um, blood, ox uh, blood oxygenation at very high resolution, and therefore has a, a potential for being able to be used to look at oxygenation in tumors and shed some light on these processes, which I've already mentioned are implicated in cell survival and ultimately also in therapeutic resistance. Prior, however, to translating a new technology such as MSOT into the clinic, we have to consider how we go about uh, validating the imaging signals in relation to the underlying biology. And this is a, quite a long process. I don't expect you to read everything on this slide, but this is a, a, a roadmap that was developed by a, a consortium uh, led by Cancer Research UK and ERTC, which identifies some of the challenges in taking an imaging biomarker or a characteristic that's measured using imaging as an indicator of the biological process, taking a new biomarker from discovery through to clinical application. And in particular, moving from discovery into um, application in the clinic requires process of technical validation and biological and clinical validation in order to cross over the first translational gap, the first hurdle there of getting out from single centers into multi-center type trials. And then finally, we have to take all of these um, different analyses together in order to achieve uptake into healthcare systems. So I very much believe that MSOT is now at a position where it's really attempting to cross over translational gap one as being used in a, a number of sentences for clinical trials, including uh, here in Cambridge, as I'll describe later. So we have to really be concerned with the, the process of technical, biological, and clinical validation. And that's what I'm going to describe to you for the rest of this presentation. Now, just an overview for those of you who are not familiar with the MSOT equipment that we are going to be discussing. We use um, MSOT devices for both preclinical studies in mice and also for clinical studies in patients. And the one you can see in front of me here is used for preclinical studies. The mouse is suspended within a, a, a cylindrical arc of transducers for ultrasound, which are over a 270 degree array. And the illumination is provided by fiber optics around that object. 
um, and the laser energy is pulsed in and the acoustic signals are detected. The sample is um, submerged in the water bath that you can see in front of you here with the um, cylindrical ring of transducers surrounding and the preparation station for the animal is uh, then on the image on the right where we um, do the preparation in order to place the mouse into the MSOT system. Now looking then, the first thing that we would like to do with a new imaging system is understand the technical validation. And the, one of the key aspects of that is precision, how repeatable and reproducible is the imaging metric. This was therefore the first aspect that we decided to interrogate and what we thought about what could have the major impact on optoacoustic tomography. For us, uh, an obvious uh, factor with the imaging system that we're using with the small animals was the anesthesia. And in this case, we um, use isofluorine gas to anesthetize the mice. What you can see plotted here are two graphs, um, each showing one parameter that we can extract immediately from the MSOP data. On the left, you see a parameter uh, of oxygen saturation, which I denote as SO2 with a subscript, a superscript MSOT. And the reason for that superscript is just that in this uh, model, we are uh, not correcting for the light propagation in the tissue, which means that we uh, can only derive a relative measure of oxygen saturation rather than an absolute value. We can also derive the total hemoglobin content by resolving the oxy and deoxyhemoglobin content and summing those together. And that's given in arbitrary units. The first thing that we did then was take a um, healthy mice and uh, perform imaging of their blood-rich organs, such as the spleen and the kidney, and look at how these uh, changes tracked as on the graphs as you see here over minutes, then over um, several hours and over several days of repeat, different repeated measurements. And the oxygen saturation trace was very stable. However, we see uh, quite a fluctuation in total hemoglobin, which is an effect which is actually known be a result of uh, isofluorine anesthesia. Then we then looked over several days, and again, the oxygen saturation metric was very stable. However, there were changes in total hemoglobin, again, consistent with previous reports of the influence of isofluorine anesthesia on the mice. Given the fluctuations that we saw, um, oxygen saturation just a, a relatively minor trend, total hemoglobin a bit larger, we developed a standard operating procedure which allowed us to extract uh, measurements that were stable. And what I show you here is measurements for repeated measures over six different re repeats for oxygen saturation and over again several days for the same metric. What that enabled us to uh, find was that when you analyze these uh, metrics over um, a larger cohort of mice, and in this study we used between seven and ten mice for our measurements, and you do this over different measurements of the same mouse and also comparing across different mice you get a really fantastic coefficient of variation. So with less than 4% for different mice and less than 2% for the same mouse. And when you relate this to precision reported for other modalities for measuring functional information like oxygenation, for example, in magnetic resonance imaging, the precision is only reported to be in the range of 10 to 15%. And with positron emission tomography, this can go even up as high as 20%. So these numbers were really uh, exciting for us and gave us great confidence that we could use this technique in a reliable way to do longitudinal studies. The next area of concern for technical validation is accuracy. So how well does the actual oxygen saturation that we measure relate to the absolute oxygen saturation of the tissue? This is a very difficult question to answer and it's still an ongoing uh, problem that we're working on. But I'd just like to share with you some of the efforts that we did to, to simulate how the light was propagating the tissue in order to better understand how quantitative our measurements would be. This is an example of a, a, a phantom that we made to image in the MSOT. This is a tissue mimicking phantom composed of agarose containing intralipid and some nigrosin dye. And the background of the cylinder of the phantom is of an absorbing absorption coefficient that's four times lower than the target cylinders that you see in the center. And what's obvious from this image is that the, the central rod, uh, the central cylinder, is appearing as a, to be of a lower concentration of absorber than the peripheral ones, and that's actually not the case. They all came to contain the same amount of absorber. And furthermore, the outside of the cylinder appears brighter than the center. So this is a clear, uh, clearly showing us that because our reconstruction isn't able to compensate for the attenuation of light 
uh, in the object that we're reconstructing, we're actually getting some, some errors introduced into our, into our images. What we then did was uh, use published uh, fluence correction methodology. And we created encoded algorithms which allowed us to simulate the fluence map. And we could then divide that by the image in order to give us a correction which normalized the, um, the background to the same signal value and also normalized the value of the targets. And just to um, show again here with a, 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 a linear section through the phantom, you can see the, the raw data shows a significant cupping artifact of beam hardening. Um, and after um, the correction, we improved that substantially. We also, after the correction, receive a linear uh, relationship between the photoacoustic signal intensity and the measured absorption coefficient. So we then thought how could we apply this in vivo, it was typically much more difficult, and we have to think about how we can actually um, run a model on a, an object which is uh, not a phantom. And this required us to do some manual segmentation of the different organs within the mouse. But what you can see at the top here is an image taken at shorter wavelengths where deoxyhemoglobin dominates, and at the bottom, uh, an image taken at longer wavelengths where oxyhemoglobin dominates. And for each of these, we simulated a fluence map, and as expected, the shorter wavelengths show much more absorption at the edges and less light getting into the center, whereas the longer wavelengths are able to propagate deeper into the mouth. If we do the same division operation and correct the data, we see some improvement in the in vivo image data. But still, this is uh, something that we're working on to determine how big an influence this has on the ab absolute value of the oxygen saturation. As this is still work in progress, we haven't applied it to the biological imaging that we'll uh, be presenting for the rest of the presentation. So you'll see that that's always denoted with the same superscript MSOL. Turning then to biological validation, how did we go about starting to think how we could connect the MSOL signals to the underlying biology? The first way we started this was thinking about setting up uh, cancer models which had different me mechanisms of vessel formation and hence would have different vessel functions. We did this with uh, two breast cancer models, which are S7 estrogen dependent line and the MDA MB231 estrogen independent line. So the MDA model is a much more aggressive tumor and the MCS7 is a much more benign tumor, but nonetheless, they're both still cancer models. And in our analysis, as uh, shown here in terms of the uh, staining for VEGF, which is an angiogenic factor, the MCF7 model is, um, uses a, a high degree of VEGF, so it's highly angiogenic in its generation of new blood vessels. This is further shown here, looking at the nitric oxide content in the serum, um, and also staining for different uh, macrophage markers, showing that the, um, the mediator here, mediators here of endothelial homeostasis and inflammation which contribute, again, to the, um, the angiogenic stimuli. On the other hand, we didn't see these factors in the... They had looked them into um, cell culture. We were able to show that the MDA cells themselves were capable of forming vessel, vessel tubular structures, which indicates that they're able to, um, despite having low angiogenic properties, create vessels um, from a, potentially from a vascular mimicry mechanism. And this is something that we're investigating further. Nonetheless, having looked at those mechanisms, we then went on to see the what types of vasculature these tumors formed. And for those of you who aren't so familiar with the differences between normal and tumor vasculature, again, I'll just highlight some of the, the biological differences. So in a normal uh, tumor blood, uh, in a normal blood vessel, you'll see a, a set of endothelial cells surrounding the blood vessels, and these are coated with other cells, parasites and smooth muscle cells, which provide structural stability and also the ability to vasoconstrict and dilate. Whereas in a tumor blood vessel, which is often formed very rapidly and in a chaotic manner, the endothelial cells will not form tight junctions between them. They will have, be leaky, and they will also lack parasites and smooth muscle cells, which will make it difficult for them to vasoconstrict and dilate. We can characterize these properties in immunohistochemistry by staining for these different blood vessels. And we did this with our breast tumor models, which showed that the aggressive MDA tumors actually had a very high density of blood vessels, a high density of endothelial cells. Um, but what they um, didn't have, which what they lacked, was coverage of parasites and smooth muscle cells. This was much lower. So this told us that although they had quite a large number of vessels, they were likely to be poorly functional compared to the more slow-growing tumor, as one might expect. 
We then um, imaged these uh, tumor models in the MSOT and indeed confirmed that the uh, oxygenation measured with the MSOT was lower in the MDA than in the MCF7. And this was exactly what we would have expected based on the characterization. And furthermore, there was a substantial disparity in the rim and core oxygenation of that same model, which again would be expected if the vascular function is poor and unable to deliver oxygenated blood to the center of the tumor. So this was all just uh, a first step in looking at how uh, MSOC could be used to assess tissue oxygenation. And it used these metrics I've described, this oxygen saturation and the total hemoglobin. But what it didn't tell us was anything about the vasoactivity or the vascular function in the tumor. So we decided to go one step further to try to reveal this. And to do that, we used the ability of oxygen enhancement, which is something that's used quite routinely in MRI in order to look at changes in the vessels. And this is a, an illustration here of our scan protocol. To do this, we uh, have the mouth breathing air and take a baseline of images, 30 images. We then switch them to breathing 100% oxygen and take a further 120 images before switching back to air and taking a further 80 images. And during that time, we track the oxygenation. To check that we were getting something that we expected, we looked at the spectral properties in these tumors. And in this case, we were looking at prostate cancer tumors with uh, taking a similar approach, choosing one that's um, androgen dependent, the LN cap, and one that's androgen independent, the PC3. And the reason for using these models in this particular setting, the LN cap is a quite hemorrhagic tumor, whereas PC3 um, has a, a relatively poor perfusion. So we can kind of look at these different aspects of vessel function and see whether we can see them apart using the oxygen enhancement. What you see from the spectra is that when we go from um, breathing air, which is denoted by red, uh, all the way through across the rainbow to purple when um, breathing oxygen, we see an increase in absorption at the long wavelengths, which are associated with absorption by oxygenated blood. So this is uh, sensible because we've increased the amount of oxygen availability to the mouth. We then looked at the kinetics of the response of both the tumor and the normal tissue. And uh, in panel E here, you see the, um, the response of the normal tissue, which is essentially a step function-like response. Whereas in panel D, where you look at the tumor tissue, it's much slower to respond. And in fact, in the LN caps, barely reaches a plateau over the 120 images that we acquired. This then tells us that there's some additional information encoded in the oxygen enhanced response that we can't find with just looking at the static response, because actually in the early time points where we're just looking at the, the oxygenation of the tumor, these two different tumors look identical. We can also map these parameters. If we look at the total hemoglobin content, you can see, actually see some pools of hemorrhage in this example LN cup tumor, um, whereas it looks quite, quite homogenous in terms of the PC3. However, when we look at oxygenation, we see a different picture. The PC3 tumor is no longer homogenous. It's actually um, got quite a marked rim core response. Um, the LN cap shows some interesting features of actually low oxygenation in regions of high blood content. We can then map our metrics related to the oxygen enhanced response. For example, we look at the responding fraction, which tells us whether or not uh, in a given pixel there was an, an enhancement following the change to oxygen gas breathing. And we can map the magnitude of that change as well. Now, both of these metrics show us um, some interesting findings. In particular, the, for the LN cap tumors, if you look at the regions indicated with white arrows of high blood content in the um, oxygen enhanced imaging, one region responds quite dramatically, whereas the other doesn't respond at all. So this might help us to identify areas of hemorrhage where there is an active perfusion. Furthermore, these images are rather heterogeneous. Uh, compared to the standard oxygen saturation, the change in oxygen saturation gives us a, a much more heterogeneous response. And we can actually quantify that uh, using a heterogeneity metric, which shows that the um, more hemorrhagic but um, uh, less aggressive LN cap tumors actually had a higher heterogeneity than the PC3s. Same, in the same way as with the, the breast cancer models, we also then thought about how to correlate these uh, measures of vascular function in vivo with ex vivo measures. And we did that in two ways. Um, in, in the beginning, we looked at the area of tumor necrotic fraction. And we also looked at Hirsch intensity, which was injected prior to sacrificing the mice, so that we could look at the correlation between um, our response markers and um, Hirsch, which is a, a marker of perfusion and permeability. 
and we showed, saw that all of the responding markers correlated very strongly with this ex vivo marker, whereas actually the total hemoglobin and the oxygen saturation at baseline were not correlated with this marker. Our studies in the prostate and breast tumor models therefore gave us some confidence in how the uh, MSOT signals actually correlate with uh, the underlying biology in the, uh, in the cancer itself. And that is then gives us confidence to go on to look at it from a clinical side for the potential of MSOT. As I described earlier, we also use MSOT in clinical studies, and we use a handheld probe in this case, which is the MSOT acuity system. And in the handheld probe, we deliver uh, light to the, the tissue and collect ultrasound uh, from the same side in the same handheld device. In terms of the clinical studies, we focused uh, using this handheld probe on breast cancer. But first, we decided to look at the, the natural changes in breast vascularity that occur during the menstrual cycle. We took a study of healthy volunteers. Apologies, I'll just recover this. We took a study of healthy volunteers and we looked at the changes in the optoacoustic signal at nanometers, which is where oxy and deoxyhemoglobin intersect. And by using that signal, we were able to see the change in the breast vascularity between the proliferative and the secretory phase, and also show that postmenopausal women had a similar signal to those women premenopausal who were in the proliferative phase of their cycle. This gave us two helpful findings. One was that we were sensitive to the expected changes in the breast vascularity. And two, we could understand how the magnitude of changes in vascularity arising from normal changes uh, during the menstrual cycle could potentially influence any imaging that we'd be doing of uh, breast cancer lesions. We've then gone on to start to look at uh, distinguishing benign and malignant breast lesions using MSOT. And here's an example of an image of a fibrocystic change, where in the grayscale on the left, you have the ultrasound image. In the fourth color in the middle, you have the optoacoustic image. And on the right, you see an overlay of both of those together. And what's interesting so far about the benign lesions is that we typically see a splaying of blood signal around the outside of those lesions, whereas in the cancers, we'll see penetrance of the blood signal into the, the tumor itself and often a cap of a regular signal above the lesion. These are just some early data, but we're very excited about using this uh, clinically going forward um, and hopefully in the future, seeing whether there is application here in assisting clinicians in delineating benign and malignant lesions. To summarize then at the end, the technical and biological validation are very important. If we want the biomarkers that we derive from optoacoustic tomography, to actually reach maturity and be ultimately applied in the clinic. We started our studies with looking at precision, and we've uh, managed to reveal very high repeatability and reproducibility when compared to literature reports from other preclinical imaging modalities. We also looked at the, the light fluence correction, understanding how light propagates in the tissue and whether that can influence measurements of oxygen saturation. And we have started to look at that in vivo, but there's a, a large amount of work that still needs to be done in that area. In terms of the biological validation, we looked at longitudinal studies of tumor growth in both breast cancer models and prostate cancer models. And we managed to um, find the expected relationships between vascular maturity as measured with histopathology and also oxygenation as measured with the MSOT. And the initial clinical studies that we've performed indicate some promising being able to delineate benign and malignant breast lesions, and we're exciting to continue on this path. So with that, I'd like to thank the people in the lab who've uh, done the work that I presented today, in particular, Joe, James, Isabel, and Michael, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for this presentation uh, and, and you taking the time to show us your very interesting work. We'll now open this up, as Sarah said, uh, for a Q&A session. If you haven't done so already, I'll just remind the, um, the attendees of the webinar that you can type your questions into the question box uh, in the webinar status bar. We do have some questions already, however. Uh, the first one, uh, Sarah, is, is the quantification of oxygenation via IMSAT uh, 
directly comparable to what you would get from other modalities. Thanks, Neil. So we have only just started really uh, looking at this in a quantitative manner, but we've begun to look at um, implementing magnetic resonance imaging in the same animals that we're performing the MSOT in. And in particular, we've uh, been developing methods which allow us to co-register those images uh, using uh, different methods of um, placing the animal as well as in uh, using fiducial markers. So we don't have that data yet, but at least qualitatively it looks like there is a relationship and it's uh, the sort of relationship that we might expect, um, but we'll have to wait for the quantitative analysis to see uh, how that actually pans out. Okay, great. Uh, another question just came in. Um, it's about the uh, responding fraction calculations uh, that you showed. And uh, the question was whether you could talk a little bit more about uh, how the, uh, says explain a bit more how the RF data uh, were used and how the region of interest were uh, made and how this data was generated. Of course. Um, so the regions of interest for the, the tumors were drawn manually um, by uh, Michael, who's a PhD student who uh, was doing this work. Um, so that's how we delineated the, the tumor area. And then in terms of the, the calculation of the responding fraction, uh, we actually set a threshold uh, above which the um, pixel was considered to respond. And we've um, looked at various ways of doing that and in fact now settled on a, a calculation of the noise in the baseline and giving a threshold as a, a, a multiple of the, the noise in the baseline, which allows us to show uh, that that pixel has responded. We then use those um, spatial maps that are generated um, by deciding whether or not a pixel was responding and giving a binarized data to calculate metrics such as the heterogeneity. So that's how we use them in our research to look at the, the heterogeneity of the vascular function. Okay, great. Uh, another question was, and uh, you, you did talk about this a bit, but uh, maybe the, the question is, is maybe just a bit more uh, information, what approach was used for the fluence correction? Of, of course, yes. So the, uh, the method that we used was um, the published approach using the delta Eddington approximation, the radius transfer equation. So this is uh, a method that's been used quite widely in the literature. And the simplification that we made in our case was to uh, segment regions, either in the phantoms or in the mouse, um, manually which we expect to have similar absorption coefficients or scattering coefficients, and that helped us to speed up the convergence of the algorithm. Okay. Uh, an additional question. Are there any ideas on how this could be used for therapy? Uh, it's not clear if the question was preclinical or clinical, but uh, how this could be used for therapy and how you might correlate the signals that you get with therapeutic response or outcome. Well, there's a, a, a reasonable body of literature looking at using this imaging technique in response to different vascular targeted therapies. So, for example, vascular disruptive agents, which give uh, a shutdown of proliferating endothelial cells, or antiangiogenic agents, which intercept angiogenic signaling and prevent development of new blood vessels. So that's uh, work that has been done in the past by others and also um, by my team, where we've looked at uh, the potential of using this to directly monitor changes in the blood uh, vessel content and also in the uh, blood oxygenation. And I think that's something that's very promising with, for the use of uh, MSOT in a clinical setting because of the fact that we have a technology that is non-invasive, is relatively low cost. It would be perfect for a therapeutic monitoring setting where you might like to do your imaging on a much more regular basis than you could perhaps afford to do if you were having to conduct an MRI scan or a PET scan on a regular basis. So having such a low-cost modality which could be implemented uh, routinely in the clinic would be uh, really interesting from the perspective of monitoring therapeutic response. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, in your presentation, Sarah, you showed uh, variability uh, that you derived from preclinical measurements. Uh, question uh, that came in is how much variability do you get uh, using the handheld detector? Has this yet been evaluated? And specifically, there were questions on whether or not the user uh, was uh, imaging at, at a different angle, uh, if you have any experience with variability in this regard. Uh, 
Uh, yes, okay. So um, just on the operator, we also evaluated operator variation in our preclinical paper, paper and we found actually that um, operators are very rapidly trained in the technique and after uh, conducting over only um, around 10 to 12 scans, they're able to uh, evaluate and um, perform data acquisition in a similarly reproducible manner as those who are much more experienced. In terms of the, the handheld probe, obviously the reproducibility and repeatability that is possible using handheld imaging techniques is uh, poorer than those uh, using techniques where the object is um, static. And there have been reports in the past with other ultrasound-based techniques in terms of variability. Um, we currently have work under review on this healthy volunteer study where we did indeed look at um, the test-retest uh, values um, f asking women to get up from the table and walk away and come back and have a repeat scan. And in that study, we um, had values in the range of between 10 and 20%. And uh, I think actually that c compares very well with the literature on ultrasound-based functional imaging techniques. So we were quite happy with that uh, as a performance metric. Mm -hmm. Uh, one uh, attendee asked, uh, uh, as he says, a, a basic question, uh, do you add formalin or any other chemicals to your phantoms? Um, in his experience, uh, phantoms that he makes uh, seem to melt and uh, he doesn't get very repeatable results. Uh, so any suggestions on, on how to make uh, a phantom in a, in a way that works better than another way? Uh, for the MSO uh, procedure, we uh, typically would uh, try to use low melting point agarose if we were having problems with um, disintegration of the phantom, and that would improve the stability. Actually, in the, the paper that we described on precision, we did include our recipe for our phantoms there, so you could actually look in detail at the particular recipe that we used. But if you're finding that temperature stability is a problem with the water bath, I'd certainly suggest a good starting point would be to use a, a, a low melting point agarose if you're looking at um, those types of phantoms. Mm -hmm. I have two more questions, and then I, I think that's, that's probably about time to wrap up. Um, do individual pixels also respond to the oxygen challenge, or is the data that's presented derived from averaging large volumes? No, individual pixels do respond, and that's where the, the spatial mapping of the responding fraction comes from. Uh, we don't use uh, the highest possible resolution pixels. We allow um, a pixel size of a 225 microns, and uh, with that we get a reasonable trade-off between uh, signal-to-noise ratio and spatial resolution, uh, but we do indeed see responses in individual pixels. Okay, final question then. Um, any insights on the source of very strong signal outside of the breast lesions? Um, the signal above, there are um, previous reports where people have described almost a blush of signal around the tumor due to the um, angiogenic process of uh, blood vessels growing in towards the tumor. Um, I'm not a clinical specialist or a radiologist, so I can't personally interpret those images, but I believe that it would be that biological process that would explain uh, the signals. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, and, and also thank you to the attendees for the insightful questions. If you have further questions that we couldn't answer today, or if you need additional information, please feel free to contact us directly by email, phone, or through our website. And again, just as a reminder, uh, we're going to post a recording of this webinar uh, and send an email follow-up so that you can have access to this just in case your colleagues uh, weren't able to join. Thank you again, and please have a nice day.